So there's possibly not anyone more in the room that hopes Rebecca will be here next week. <laughs> this is the second week in a row uh, where during the week I found out uh, I'm gonna be bringing the Word of God. Uh, sorry about that, but... <laughs> <laughs> so I want to tell you a little bit about what happened in my preparation this week. Uh, first, I wasn't expecting it, and <laughs> so I, I jumped in, I put about four hours in the topic of anxiety, and I was writing away, and the more I wrote about it, the more I kind of got down. And when you write a sermon, it's really important that God is moving on your spirit in your preparation of excitement to share it with the church. And I pray for you and I picture your faces as I write, hoping that God would minister to, and I get excited about what it is to bring it. And I spent four hours on anxiety and I just got more and more kind of down. And so I spoke to my wife and I said, hey, here's what I've been doing, but here's where I kind of feel like I should go. And she said, that's the talk you need to give. So then I spoke to a couple of New Hopers and they said, that's what our church needs to hear right now. So, okay. And I spoke to a staff member and they said, not only do I think that's the talk that the church needs to hear, I personally need to hear that talk. And so I completely changed direction and I wanna do a talk today that I believe is very much in line with this HELP series but my heart is that we would walk out of here encouraged because I feel like we have all been beaten up emotionally, mentally in the last couple of years. And so what I wanna do, I wanna look at Jesus' last assignment that he had on earth. The last assignment that is predominantly recorded in John 20 and 21. And what happens is Jesus has this assignment to build and launch the most influential movement that will echo across the arc of human history, and he just has 40 days to do it. And as we look at this this morning, I believe it reveals the heart of God with how Jesus uses those 40 days as much as any other New Testament passage. And I wanna encourage you in it today, because I think we could relate with what it would mean to start to think about if we had to launch a movement in 40 days, how would we go about it? You would think that Jesus strategically would know that he needs to get in front of the most influential people of the time, right? Start to impact them and they will spread the word around. So at least go to Rome and get in front of Caesar. Go to the Colosseum when one of the gladiators is on and, and have a time of speaking to 50,000 people and then sending them out. These are the things that we would think about doing and Jesus does none of those. Jesus does not get mass marketing happening. He does not choose the most influential leaders of the time. He does not get an A team together. He actually does the opposite. How he uses those 40 days is so revealing of the heart of God for you and I today. And so I want to jump in to what Jesus' strategy was and launch it today. Because the enemy is bombarding us with lies constantly in this season of our lives. These mindsets that we have that have taken us to a place of emotional and mental uh, just debilitation we get to the place where the lie of the enemy is because of the way you feel, because of how downtrodden you are, you are ineligible to be used by God. That you can no longer feel that you are worthy for God's activity in your life and through your life. You feel disqualified. And so I wanna dive in and unpack this because this is not what Jesus does when he launches the church in 40 days. He goes after four specific people, four people who are all in a season of being defeated emotionally and mentally. The first person that I wanna look at that Jesus goes to find is Peter. 
Peter, who at the time is beating himself up and feeling all kinds of shame. The first person Jesus goes after is someone feeling shameful. To give a quick recap, Peter is the guy who by the power of Jesus literally walked on water. A couple of years ago uh, with my wife, we're on the Sea of Galilee. We didn't quite have the faith to walk on water, so we chartered a boat. Um, But in this conversation, we're talking about this is the very body of water that Peter, by the power of Jesus, walked on top of. Peter had a moment of embodying the supernatural power of the kingdom of God. It is inconceivable. And yet, with all of that, Peter not once but three times after Jesus says it's going to happen, Peter says there's no way it's gonna happen, but Peter did what he didn't think he was capable of. When the pressure was on, Peter denied even knowing Jesus. Peter was one who not only saw Jesus do miracles, he experienced himself. I don't know if you've met someone at work or in your life group or here at church where part of their story is they walked on water. I've never met anyone who has that story. Peter did. And when the pressure was on, he denied even knowing Jesus. And now Peter is so filled with shame at his failure to be faithful. He's devastated and he recoils to the man that he was before he met Jesus. He went back to fishing. These nets that he had left three years earlier, he picks them up again. He entered into an agreement with the lies of the enemy that because of his failure, he was no longer qualified to be a follower of Jesus. And so he goes back to what he did before. Maybe some of you need to hear this, the beginning of this talk. God hasn't given up on you. Maybe you, like Peter, you've said, I'm gonna follow Jesus right to the end. To the very end, I'm gonna be faithful. And then you misstep along the way. You didn't even think you were capable of this kind of misstep. But God didn't go after the faithful. He chose the unfaithful the ones that felt shameful, the ones that felt discouraged. And Jesus is still calling the unfaithful. He's still calling the failed. He's still calling those who feel a sense of shame because of what they have done. John records in chapter 21 that Jesus goes out to find Peter. Peter is fishing all night and Jesus gets to the shore ahead of him and cooks breakfast. He gets some fish and some bread on a, on a charcoal fire. Actually, it sounds really good, doesn't it? <laughs> Jesus makes you breakfast, you know it's gonna be good. Uh, and there he meets Peter. And he meets Peter in his shame. And there Jesus forgives him. And Peter goes from shameful to forgiven. From hopeless to hopeful, from a fisherman to an evangelist. You know, in our culture, our whole value system is celebrating success, the powerful, the wealthy, the attractive. But you know what is an even better story? A better story is a God who takes the shameful. He restores them with hope and invites them to join Him in making something beautiful out of their lives. This is the beauty of the gospel. And if you feel shame this morning, God hasn't finished with you yet. He is coming to find you. The next person Jesus goes to find to build his church is those who doubt, the doubters. Thomas is perhaps the most famous doubter in human history. He became known for one very significant moment when he was called to be a great man of faith, but in that moment, his faith failed him. And ever since, he has been known as Doubting Thomas. What is interesting is there are many times prior to this event, 
that Thomas was actually the outspoken, bold, with courageous faith man in the group. In John 11, for example, Thomas and the other disciples hear that Lazarus, their friend, had died, and one suggests that they go and visit. Another speaks up and says, we cannot go. The religious leaders already have accused Jesus of blasphemy, and they want to stone him to death, and we will get stoned at the same time. In the group, it is Thomas who speaks up and says, if Jesus gets stoned, then we get stoned. It's worth it for the movement. Thomas was so all in, he was prepared to go towards danger, not to flee from it. And then what feels seemingly a few moments later in John 20, verse 24, this famous passage. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and I put my finger where the nails were and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Who does that? I mean, going from moments of remarkable, bold faith, willing to give up your life for the cause, for the movement, and then the next moment, questioning whether God even exists. Who does that? I do that. I do that. When uh, I started to get uh, in a ministry just prior to that, I owned a, a small construction company. And I ran this company and uh, made enough money that I could then work part-time at the church. And uh, then we had an opportunity in 2003 to move to Nashville, uh, where I went into full-time ministry at that point. We were there for a couple of years, and uh, Steph and I were loving living in America, and we had a, a dream of being permanent residents here. And 2005, we applied for green cards, and we were really excited. And then 18 months later, uh, I get notified by immigration uh, that there's an issue with my work visa. So in 2007, I have to go back to Melbourne to the US Embassy, and get a new stamp on my passport. Well, when I get back there, uh, I discover as I see the Consulate General that the guidelines have changed and my visa uh, is no longer valid. And so he says, uh, there's actually three years until you can apply for a visa again. Now, my wife and our daughter were in Nashville and I had just come to Australia for two weeks to get a stamp and then to go back. He tells me, I can't apply for a visa for three years, and there is also a re-entry bar on my passport for three years. What that meant is I had to call my wife back in Nashville and say, you need to sell our house, sell our cars, sell our furniture, pack a couple of suitcases, you're moving back to Australia. And so in 2007, we felt our dream was over. And I doubted. I doubted everything about God's direction and purpose in my life. I doubted the call of ministry on my life. You see, things did not go the way I expected them to go. God did not do what I wanted Him to do. Therefore, I believed he did not want me to be in ministry. And I doubted that call. So do you know what I did? When a church came and asked me to join their staff, I said no. I turned my back on ministry because I doubted my call. What I did was I joined my parents' construction business. You see, I had done that before, so I went back to what I knew. And I became a project manager for houses. And so 
Instead of going to church every day and being in the ministry, I was putting on steel cap boots, a hard hat and a clipboard and going out to the building site. I oversaw the, the demolition of old houses and then the foundations of new houses, the framing, the roof, then the drywall, the bathrooms, the whole thing. I did six brand new houses over 18 months and then that church circled back again. And they said to me, we've been waiting. Are you ready yet? And there was an opportunity where God had come and he was restoring my call. He was recommissioning me. Though I had doubted my call, God sought me out in my doubt. And I uh, ministered there for two years and then they uh, brought in a new senior pastor and allowed us to move back to the US. And I wonder if there is doubt in your story today. Because I am amazed at my ability to doubt the activity of God. I've been a pastor for 20 years and it hasn't made me bulletproof to doubt. We all doubt. That's the truth. See, I can have incredible moments of God's activity, God's provision, God's guidance. And the next minute, I can question when things don't go the way I want them to go or the way I expect them to go, I can then doubt God's existence. Yes. Yes. Doubts historically have not been particularly welcomed in the church. It's not something we talk about a lot, probably because we feel a sense of shame. We feel like the person sitting next to us when the intensity of life's challenges get turned up, they're full of faith in those moments and you feel like in your moments, you actually doubt God's call on your life. And so the church has not been a place where we talk about our doubts. But do you know that Scripture is full of testimonies when people are walking through incredibly intense moments in their life, what do they do? They doubt God. Yes. I'd rather be part of a faith community, by the way, that welcomes unfiltered doubts and honest uncertainties. Yes. That the doormat says, come as you are. Yes, sir. Because we're all sitting in a room where the person next to us, we've probably out them 10x <laughs> if the truth was told. Yes, yes. So why don't we just lay that down and let unfiltered doubts be the reality of what it means to walk with brothers and sisters through every season of our faith journey. Yes. Because God is not afraid of our doubts. Yes. That is the truth. Because Jesus deliberately recruited a doubter. He went after Thomas. He'd visited the disciples. Eight days later, he went back again because he knew Thomas would be there this time. And he goes to recruit Thomas the doubter. Maybe because of a series of circumstances that have taken place in your life. This morning, you're at a crossroads in your faith journey. This morning, you once had a passion for God, a driving desire to run after the things of God in your lives, but now that has seemed to drift away. Friends, I've said it, I'm gonna say it again, God is not afraid of your doubts. He chose a doubter to launch the church. Now the truth about Thomas after this famous event it's a little known fact that Thomas was the only apostle to preach outside the Roman Empire. Thomas went on to India and planted a collection of churches and those churches can still be traced to churches today, 2,000 years later. What Thomas did, Thomas ultimately died in India with a courageous faith and boldness as a martyr for Christ. That's what God did with Thomas's doubt. 
So what does God do with people who have doubts? What does He do with people who have uncertainty? God restores them. He fills them with levels of unparalleled passion and unleashes them on an unbelieving world. An encounter with Jesus can change a doubter in a moment. Then get this, your story, if you are a doubter this morning, is not over. God is not finished with you yet. The next person is actually the very first person that Jesus goes to find. It's someone who is deeply disappointed. John 20, verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. We can relate with the disappointment that Mary feels for her friend Jesus had died. The context of Mary Magdalene's life tells us actually a lot more about her disappointment though. It's not exactly known who this Mary is. Theologians still debate that perhaps Mary Magdalene was the woman who recorded in Luke 7, poured out expensive perfume on Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. It's debated that the sinful woman would indicate likely a past in prostitution. We do know that society had ostracized and shamed her, but what she found in Jesus was someone who gave her back her dignity and renewed purpose in her life. Remember just what a male-dominated patriarchal society this was. Here's the background of that time. A woman in the legal system of the first century could not give testimony for an eyewitness account in the court of law. Because she was a woman, her testimony was not credible simply because she was a woman. A woman could see an eyewitness to a crime and could not be used in court. Mary Magdalene's entire future was wrapped up in being a follower of Jesus. From a cultural perspective, she had been accepted as a follower of Jesus, so she had protection and dignity because of it. But now, she believed that Jesus was dead, and she has a complete lack of hope for her future. She was deeply disappointed And this is not how she saw this ending. This was completely unexpected. There was nothing that led her to believe that she would be where she was on this day. And maybe today, you're walking through something that you never saw happening. Maybe you feel like you've just felt lost in deep disappointment and uncertainty these days. Maybe you feel trapped in some living situation that you thought you would be out of by now. Some difficulty at work that is simply unjust. Maybe it's your marriage and you find yourself fighting to keep it alive. Perhaps you'd put so much hope in starting a family and it just hasn't happened yet. Maybe you're walking through life without a companion and you're seeing people around you get engaged and get married and you still feel alone. Perhaps your disappointment is with a loved one who has a hardship that you can't fix for them. Just thinking this is not how this was supposed to go. Finding yourself deeply discouraged and disappointed this morning. This encounter with Jesus continues in verse 14. She, Mary, turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying, Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. Perhaps the reason that Mary didn't recognise it was Jesus because she was so deep in her disappointment. She didn't recognise because she didn't expect to see him. Verse 16, Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, teacher. Or maybe more accurate, 
my teacher. This is a powerful encounter where all of a sudden she realises that it's Jesus. This morning you need to know that Jesus desires to find you in your disappointment. Today he calls your name. He wants to tell you that your story is not over. He wants to restore you back to life and the heart of God and the purpose of God in your life. He wants you to know that you do not have to be stuck in your disappointment. He wants to restore you today. Maybe because of your emotional and mental health right now, you are just stuck in discouragement and disappointment. You need to know God desires to restore you. Of all the people that Jesus could find in the last 40 days, with the most important assignment to launch the church, he went to find those who were disappointed and who had given up. Jesus is still finding the disappointed. And if that's you this morning, he hasn't given up on you. A quick theological side note. This passage has deep implications for elevating women in leadership. In stark contrast to the culture of the day, Jesus was always elevating women. No more than in this particular encounter. You see, in this post-resurrection era, the era that we are part of today, the first person to ever see the risen Jesus Christ, the first person to ever be called by name, the first person to be sent out was not a man. Jesus entrusted the message of the most important event in human history. Jesus Christ is alive. He is risen from the dead. He called that message to be delivered, not by a man, but by a woman. I love the theologian N.T. Wright. He says, with this argument, it's all downhill from there about that (laughs) elevating of women. I love that. The last group that Jesus went to find was a group of afraid disciples. Verse 19, on the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. What is wrong with this picture? If there's a group of guys that should have been fearless, it was these guys. These were the guys who were closest to Jesus over the last three years. They literally had front row seats to the many miraculous miracles that Jesus performed. Like the time he took a couple of fish and five loaves and there were 5,000 men, probably 20,000 people on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and he feeds them all with this. They were the ones who saw him with the sound of his voice. Sometimes he didn't even bother to go to the sick person. He just said, go, your son has been healed. They experienced this firsthand, front row seats to this. They saw Jesus command the wind and the waves and they obeyed Him. They saw Him heal lepers, deaf and blind. They saw Him walk on water many times. But these were the people who were afraid. They saw so many unexplained things and yet where does Jesus find them? Jesus finds them locked up, hiding under a bed because they fear for the ones that have killed Jesus are also coming now after them. This is where Jesus finds them. This group of men were so afraid and Jesus still chooses them. Jesus finds them to launch the movement of the kingdom of earth, kingdom of heaven here on earth. He goes after those that are fearful. Maybe this morning you have a level of fear in your life. Perhaps you're here and and, and you wanna grow spiritually, but at the same time you're holding back because you're a little afraid of what it would mean to completely give your life over to Jesus. You, You haven't quite abandoned 
give an abandonment to all of those other areas of your life. You know, if, if your life was represented in your heart and, and it had all different rooms in it, you've, you've given most of the rooms over to God, but there, are, there is one room that you're not allowing Jesus to enter into. And it's because you're afraid, maybe of what friends would say, maybe that family would ridicule you if you went all in for Jesus. Maybe you're afraid because if you allowed God to enter into that room, he would see the things that you have done. And you're afraid that you would be accepted if he really knew. Afraid to trust in God's grace in your life. Well, take heart, my friend. Jesus not only accepts the fearful, he not only accepts those who are afraid, he goes out to find them. Jesus actually handpicked a selection of people who were afraid. In verse 21, it goes on and he says again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the kindness of mercy in your life. Receive grace for what you have done and who you were. For now I accept you and welcome you into the family of God. For I have a plan and purpose for your life and is not to condemn you for what you have done. It is to release you into the freedom because of what Jesus has done. This is what Jesus does. So this morning, I wanna remind you, God wants to restore your life. He wants to restore hope in you. Maybe you find yourself at a point of failure and shame, and God wants you to know that He chooses you. Your story is not over yet. If you find yourself at a point of doubt, God wants to replace that with belief, passion, and purpose. If you find yourself in a place of disappointment right now, God wants to replace that with hope, belief, and faith. And if you find yourself in a point of fear, being afraid right now, God wants to replace that with the kind of courage that drives God-empowered confidence in your life to know that you are a son, you are a daughter of the Most High, and you are accepted by Him. What God wants to give you is not of this world. When Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit, it was not of this world. What God wants to impart in you today is not of this world. It's not something that you can conjure up in your own abilities. It's not part of your personality. It's not hindered and based on your skin colour. It is based on the outpouring of the Spirit of the living God. It is based on the unlimited resources of a God of mercy and of love from the Kingdom of Heaven into your life today. Know that when Jesus had an assignment of launching the most important movement, He didn't go after the all-stars. He didn't go after the most influential, powerful, wealthy. He went after people like you and me. Think about it. He went after people like you and me. And here's the truth, 2,000 years later, that movement is still alive and well like the first 40 days when he did it. And we're invited into it. Because what I wanna say to you is Jesus wants to breathe on you and say, receive the Holy Spirit. I wonder if you're able, if you would stand to your feet. I wanna pray for you today. I wanna ask if you would close your eyes and just bow your head and, and just focus on this very personal space, just you and your chair, just you in this space. And I wanna ask specifically 
for you to recognize and no one's looking around and I just wanna pray if you feeling shameful today, would you just raise your hand quickly and then just put it down? No one's looking around. Thank you. Thank you, yes, God bless you. Yeah, lots of hands, God bless you, yeah. If you're in a season of doubting today, would you just raise your hand? Yeah, yeah, wow, thank you, God bless you. The balcony, thank you, yeah, yeah, see that. Thank you. If you're in a season of disappointment, things have not gone the way you expected them to go. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your honesty. If you're afraid this morning, you're, you're fearful. Yeah, lots of hands. Thank you. Yeah. So God in heaven, what we're asking right now is for outpouring of your supernatural power in this place. For folks who are online praying through these same things, that you would restore hope you would restore faith, you would restore belief this morning. God, I wanna pray that you would breathe on your people today and that they would receive your Holy Spirit, that you would usher in a season of restored hope. Give forgiveness and acceptance where there is shame. Restore belief where there is doubt, encouragement where there is disappointment, courageous faith where there is fear. For God, we believe you have the power to answer this prayer. God, we believe that you have the desire to answer this prayer. And so with the authority given to us by the Father in Jesus' name, we pray. Father, I ask the ministry of the Holy Spirit to go to every person who has raised their hand this morning, just with courage and vulnerability and honesty, God, they just raised their hand to you and just said, help, help. Father, would you minister like only you can? Bring restoration of hope, restored belief in this place. And we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. And everyone agreed, said, amen and amen.